This is the Ransom Tart Podcast. I'm Alan Arnold, and it's the week of January 13th. We're in part two of a conversation with John and me on story. It's called God Movies in Your Story because we're understanding and unpacking not only how to view stories that we watch or read, but actually how to understand better the story we're living, to understand what chapter we're in, what to do when our own story feel stuck. I think you're going to really enjoy this. We originally recorded this conversation in 2018, and now here's the second half of God, Movies, and Your Story. Alan, what film in recent years has particularly grabbed you? Well, it's The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and the Ah. reason, it's basically the story of a man who has no life yet he's working at Life Magazine. (laughs) And so it's this perfect, ironic setup. And he finds himself in really the bowels of the company on on the bottom floor underground working with negatives. And his life is negative, and it's all about other people, and he stays hidden. And yet he gets pulled into this adventure, this journey of not only trying to find this image for the cover of Life Magazine, but that that search opens his life up to who he is. And so it's an amazing journey, transformative movie, and just really spoke to my heart. A man who has lost heart. Yes. Clearly. He's taken out. Right. And battle to fight, adventure to live. And a beauty. And a beauty. Yes. Yeah, I'm telling you. Folks, welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge this week with Alan Arnold again, because we're picking up a conversation we started last time about how do you look at movies and get so much out of it. And it was uh, prompted by an email that we got a request from a listener saying, hey, could you say more about that? Because you guys seem to see a whole lot more in movies than I do. Um, What are you looking for? How do you do that? And we'd love to unpack that a little bit more for you. So, John, before we even go further, what's one of your movies in the last year or two that really stood out? Oh, recently, no question, Darkest Hour. And why uh, is that? The Churchill film. I've seen it three times. The story is so powerful, first off, because it's true, um, to be reminded of the horrors of the Nazi regime and the very real possibility that that was going to take over Europe and England for decades. I mean, that you know, that was not a done deal, gang. We're looking at the story after the victory, but the very, very real nature of evil in the world, such a sober reminder. And then Churchill, his courage. And for me, one of the most powerful things in the film is the members of his cabinet, Chamberlain, Halifax, who wanted compromise with Hitler. For me, it was a very graphic picture of our moment, uh, particularly in the church and the majority of people that do not want to face the war. They don't want to fight the battle. They were trying so hard to keep England from going to war when, in fact, going to war was exactly what England needed to do and exactly what the U.S. needed to do. Yeah, so leadership, courage, the battle, all of it, so, so powerful. And again, folks, we don't go into movies going, okay, what does this have to teach me? You know, we just go in looking for a good story. But our point is, if it's a good story, it's going to have all kinds of imagery and illusions and symbolisms and metaphors and sometimes just outright portrayals of the deep truths of human life and the deep truths of the the Christian experience. And what's amazing is a lot of times the director, the producer, the actors don't even realize the deeper truths. I can't tell you, John, how many times I've heard an interview where like Toy Story was being talked about recently. And one of the key people who helped make that movie was adamant that there were no Christian themes in the movie. And the person in the conversation was saying, no, 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 there's so many. And he literally, he was getting furious 
because he was saying it's impossible. And yet it was there. Okay. Okay. So little side note on that. For centuries, the world had oral tradition and the world would tell stories. And so your community had a library, so to speak, of stories, myths, legends, heroes, fairy tales that were used for entertainment and instruction and that sort of thing. And then, of course, you have the teachings of Jesus and his parables. You have all the epic stories of the Old Testament. In our current hour, I believe God is using movies. Not all of them, mind you, not all of them. But God is far bigger than any director, writer, or group of actors. And in movies that are not made by Christians and not made to carry a Christian theme are carrying incredible right. Christian themes and because they're simply true to the nature of human experience. They're true to the nature of reality. They're true to the struggle of um, good and evil. And then, and then some other sweeping themes. One of the things that you want to be aware of, let's just start with worldview. Like, where is this coming from? What, what's kind of the operating premise of this? Uh, because I think Shakespeare was an absolutely <laughs> brilliant writer. I mean, pff, there's an obvious statement. Um, I don't think that there's convincing evidence to believe that he was a Christian. However, he was operating from a Christian worldview. And so when Hamlet and Horatio encounter the the walking ghost of Hamlet's father on the parapets, the first thing out of their mouths is, angels and ministers of heaven defend us. Mm. And it's such a moving scene. Yes. And you get this powerful story because Shakespeare was just saturated in a culture that had a Christian worldview. And can God use all that? You bet he can. Does it have to be that the director and the writer were Christian? Not at all. And on the other hand, keep your guard up or be sensitive in the spirit because um, there was a conversation where the creator of a sitcom that's on right now was talking about story and art, very creative person. But his comment was, in the first few episodes of, of a sitcom, all I have to do is get you to love the characters. Once you love the characters, I can change your opinion on anything because right? whatever I have them do, yes. you're going to follow. Yeah, yeah. And he wasn't saying it for good. Yes. So you do have to be aware of the storyteller and yes. what's going on. What What is the worldview? So, for example, I had cited Shakespeare. We cited Lord of the Rings, Darkest Hour, Walter Mitty. Let me give you a contrast. There's a very, very popular documentary that came out. Um, several years ago, 180 Degrees South. And it's a very powerful story, um, very popular among millennials. And Yvonne Chouinard started Patagonia. His friend, I think it's uh, Dave Tompkins, but forgive me if I've got that wrong, started North Face. That's the point. It's a very moving story, and it's, it's got hip music and a cool vibe, and it's this trip to South America, and it's surfing, and it's people, and it's fighting for care of creation. It, it just The vibe of this thing is so cool. And then you get to that climax moment, and they've got Yvonne Chouinard himself, you know, going on this climb in South America with these guys, and he gives the, the big messages— Gang, he says, you got to do something to save your soul, whatever that is. And I was furious. I wanted to throw something through the screen of the television I was watching it on, you know, because the worldview, no matter how beautifully filmed it is, no matter how uh, seductively cool it is, in the end, the worldview is just crass relativism and, and frankly, cynicism and nihilism, and it did not, it was not, there is meaning. That doesn't mean every story has to have a happy ending, okay? Because some stories don't, but they still have profound and beautiful meaning to them. Of all the Star Wars films that have come out, and recently, you know, we've had this rush of the new trilogy that's being made and released, and, and then the inter- trilogy singles that they're um, releasing, I thought Rogue One was extraordinary. And partly because it is the story of good and evil, 
It is the enormous risk that it takes to overthrow evil. It is courage. It is sacrifice. It is friendship. It is valor. And in the end, spoiler alert, they die for a greater good. And it's not your happy little Star Wars movie, you know, with the heroes and the droids skipping off into the sunset. It's a very sober look at the cost of the battle. And I absolutely love that film. Yes. Because of the worldview. Yes. Okay. So you can see it's not just about happy, right? So Alan, what else, what else resonates with you when you're thinking categories, things that story and film speak to you in? The topic that we had last time that I think is worth just touching on again is if it's true, then it's good ground to go into, even if it may be a little more rough. Uh, and an example of that, John, this morning, I drive my three kids to school every morning. And we're talking about movies and story and book, but songs are really story set to lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. And so in my truck every day, each kid gets to pick a song, whatever it is. Well, this morning, we're listening, and my oldest son plays a rap song. And it's it, it's kind of a, a rant. <laughs> right. And we're all, that's good. And we're all thinking, uh, boy, this, I'm not sure what this song really has to offer. It's a, it was, but it was about ego being toxic. So then my daughter plays a song, sweet sounding love song. But if you start listening to the lyrics, it's basically about a boy trying to get intimate, too intimate with a girl too quickly. But on the surface, her sounded like a Disney song and his sounded like a hard rap song. So we had this really good conversation because she said, well, your song isn't even Christian. And it was a question of, well, actually, that song was about ego and toxicity. This song was about moving too fast in a relationship without any meaning. And so, John, I think as listeners are thinking about this, you have to move past a category of is the movie R-rated or PG-13 or PG? And yes, there's certain things you don't bring children to. But for whether we're watching it or allowing it in our home, the real question to me is, even in video games, what are we bringing in? Because it will change the atmosphere yep. of the house. Yeah. What's the spirit of it? What's the worldview? Right. What's the world? I'm going to start pounding on the table. What is the yes. worldview? Okay. Yes. So we do need to pause for a moment because I was speaking at a large conference several years ago and I was I was teaching on epic and I was teaching on the larger story and I was using films and I was using clips from Gladiator and Braveheart and maybe even at the time Titanic. Um, scandalous. And <laughs> But I was illustrating how the gospel is in these things. And the very famous pastor that got up after me said, yeah, well, we don't show R-rated films in our home. Now, as you say, there is age appropriate and there's film appropriate. And I just want to point out, gang, hang on. The Bible is R-rated. The Bible is a very, very graphic story with um, prostitution and incest, with adultery and murder. It is a very, very violent book. Peter cuts off the ear of the servant of the priest in the garden. You have the massacre of the innocents. You have all these little boys that are slaughtered by Roman troops. And the Bi folks, the Bible is a very real book. It's not sanitized. It's not sweet. And it sure isn't PG. So, as you're trying to say, Alan, it's not just what's the rating, though that's important. Okay. So, let me come back to some categories here. I just want to start throwing some movies out. And we were talking about worldview and one story around that. So, George MacDonald, famous, uh, at least if you've listened to us, he's famous. He's not famous out in the world, but Scottish poet, um, writer, novelist, uh, storyteller, pastor, was instrumental in C.S. Lewis's conversion. And as C.S. Lewis tells the story, he picked up MacDonald's fairy tale called Fantasties. Now, Fantasties is a very wild book. I, I, I like it, but it's, it's hard reading. And, and it is a fairy tale, but it's sure not a Disney fairy tale. 
And Lewis says that what he encountered in Fantasties and in George MacDonald was goodness. It was simply the presence and the power of goodness. And I think that's partly because MacDonald was a man so saturated himself with goodness and with the holiness of God. And the stories that he wrote took goodness very, very seriously. Now, there's betrayal, and, and there's temptation, and there's slander, and, and there's a fall. There's a fall. There's always a fall, right? Because there's a fall of man, and there's a fall of Peter. And the scripture says the righteous man may fall seven times a day, but he gets back up. Um, but in MacDonald, what he encountered was goodness. Okay. And, and Lewis said, it baptized my imagination. I just had never mm. encountered that kind of goodness before. So the overall effect of it, though it may be sad, though it may be heartbreaking, the overall effect of it is I am drawn toward goodness. I long for the good. So. Other categories, obviously, we've been talking about the battle of good and evil. That's going to let go of that. I'm going to go on. Alan, you mentioned something I thought that was very, very powerful, um, the issue of identity. Yes. And how many stories turn on the necessity of the hero or the heroine or the group of people even coming to their true identity? Almost every good story. To me, it goes back, John, to the hero's journey that for listeners, if, if you're not aware of that, it's like you were mentioning in our first podcast, every story has certain beats. And so they mirror our story. And part of that is discovering who we are. And that's why that that is similar in so many stories. But Madeline LaEngle um, had a quote that says, stories are able to help us become more whole, to become named. And naming is one of the impulses behind all art, to give a name to the cosmos we see despite all the chaos. And I think that's what the best stories do is this theme of not just naming what's around us, but giving us a name, an identity for who we are. And, and one of my favorite trilogies, uh, it's, it's by an author named Stephen Lawhead, and he wrote a series called Song of Albion. So it's Celtic uh, mythology, but it's also rooted in the current day, and, and he steps into this other reality. But listen to this. It's a really short quote, but it touches on the naming, and it touches on identity. And it's, it's on the front page of the journal that I have right now. There, in the deep-hearted darkness of the night, I stroll the pebbled beach, gazing up at the brilliant stars, listening to the play of water on the shore. I was astonished. Never in all my life had I been so moved by a simple song about a mermaid. I could neither believe nor understand what had happened to me, for it seemed that something inside me had been awakened. Some long sleeping part of me had been roused to life, and now I could no longer be who I was before. But if I was no longer to be who I was, who was I to be? Oh, I, I'm right there. Who am I? So, right? It's Jean Valjean. It's, it's, right, it's the turning right. point of Les Mis is his encounter with the priest and his struggle with identity of is he going to live as the the convict, right? Or right. is he going to come to a new identity? And back to Rogue One, you know, Jin Erso, early in the film, who's going to be the heroine, mm -hmm. early in the mm -hmm. film, cynical, unbelieving, uh, shut down, resigned, self-protective, doesn't like being Jen Urso, and she actually is operating right. under an alias. Right. Uh, but then when she learns who her father truly is and what he is doing to live, you know, the cost he's paid to live valiantly, then she wants to rise up to her name. And, you know, gang, like, how many of you mm. have gotten a new name from God that's a character from a movie. How many yes. Maximuses are there out there, right? <laughs> yes. Because God will use those stories in your quote to awaken the heart, right? to awaken the heart and to bestow identity. And John, don't you think that's why if you're at a movie and whether you're watching a trailer or whether you're watching the specific movie you went for, when you start to tear up in a movie, when something is causing you to choke up a little bit, 
that is fertile ground to go into, if not right then, later, of what is that that's causing these tears? Because so often that's identity related. Yes. Or story related. Norman MacLean, who wrote A River Runs Through It, a film which totally filleted me, um, not about identity, but because of loss. Mm. Um, in that movie, it's a family that falls apart. And uh, and at the end of it, I was just weeping, weeping over the own losses of my own life. And that kind of piercing uh, can be very good, gang, particularly if you invite God into it. Anyway, McLean wrote a book later in life, a uh, nonfiction book about the Man Gulch Fire in Montana called Young Men in Fire. It's a very, very, very powerful book. And in the beginning, he says, a search for identity is not something that just possesses the youth. It's something that compels us all our life. And he's writing this in his 80s. And he says, in fact, when that search ends, we probably are headed for the grave. He goes on to say, one of the great helps in that is to find a story that explains your story to you. Mm. So over the holidays, uh, I was looking for some reading and I just wanted something outside of, you know, uh, current affairs. I wanted something outside, frankly, you know, my profession in counseling and psychology. I just didn't want to read any of that stuff. And so I picked up Lord of the Rings. Now, I, the book, I haven't read the book, the whole big trilogy for more than 15 years. And what was so powerful for me were there were moments in their story absolutely gripped me because they felt like moments in mine. And like, pay attention, gang. That's a gift from God. Like, if that's going on in you while you're watching or reading something, like, heads up, like, pause or go back and watch it again, like I did with Darkest Hour three times. But stories can often help you interpret your own story. They, they can help you identify emotions that are stuck. They can take you into places of lost identity. Or another favorite film of mine, a lesser known film called On a Clear Day. It's a UK film. Interestingly, several of the actors from Braveheart are in it, but as completely different characters. And it's a, it's a father-son story, and it's a father-wound story. And it is a powerful, powerful story because it goes into deep themes, again, that are just simply true to the human heart. Childhood, loss, what our father taught us about ourselves. And, and then, yes, redemption. In that film, uh, there's an extraordinary redemption story. I think redemption's important, gang. I, I don't think every story has to have a happily ever after, but in this age of um, cynicism, resignation, unbelief, nihilism, like if you walk out of a film and it just rips you of hope, and rips you of meaning and just kind of leaves you with the feeling of there is no redemption. <laughs> Not a good Watch story. Out. Watch out. Yeah. And just a few weeks ago, I saw The Greatest Showman, a musical. Yep. I don't tend to go to musicals. My wife had seen this and said, you've got to go see this. Well, I'm there with my 17-year-old son and literally tearing up like every five minutes. And he's looking at me like, dad, what what's going on? Like this, it's a, a musical about P.T. Barnum, the, the man who started the circus. But what was going on on a heart level, I knew, was it was about a man who nobody really believed in, and he pursued this dream that he had zero chance to achieve, and against all odds, by bringing together misfits like him and outcasts, this beautiful thing happened. And, and so on a heart level, if you get beyond the literal well, is this exactly factual or... Or, or well, is this exactly like my story? Right. Like, I'm not going to be a circus man. Yes. But it's a story of the heart. And so the rhythm of the heart, if you'll use that... And John, you always say, test things by the fruit. What fruit is it? So like you said, if you leave something, either feeling, man, maybe I really should pursue that affair, or maybe <laughs> I should... You know, and there's all these movies that glorify... I mean, you rarely see in a movie a husband and wife in love. Right. It's always the outside person drawn to the other person. And so what is the fruit of this movie? Is it is it causing you to love God deeper, to love your family deeper, to want to run more into the dreams that God's given you? Or 
Is it something that has a toxic effect? That is a heart level, spirit led. I think that's where we ask God for eyes to see. There's some trailers where I've walked out during the time of the trailers before a movie because maybe it was a horror film. And I was like, I, I just don't, I just don't want to be in the room with this. I'll come back for the movie. And it's not because I had a young kid. I don't want that in my mind. Exactly. Yeah. We've talked about courage. We've talked about sacrifice, identity. Right. Worldview. Worldview. We've talked about creation, fall, rescue, restoration. And you just can't avoid that. You just can't get past that. And while the ending of Gladiator is in some ways very tragic, Maximus dies, the symbolism of Christ dying for us, and Maximus's last words are free the prisoners. You know, like, come on, that's Isaiah 61. Oh, cow, he gave his life to free us. The overall effect of it, um, so powerful on the themes of fall and sin. It's very honest. It's very honest. We're not talking about dishonest, sweet little films. So many Christian films are not honest about evil. They're not honest about the human heart. They're not honest about redemption. And that's why they just feel so two-dimensional. They don't feel powerful. I think restoration is a very important part of the story. It's certainly a critical part of ours. And while not every film has to have restoration, it does have to have the promise of it. Um, a very difficult film that I love is the old film, The Mission, about the Jesuit priests in South America and, and based on true events and bringing the gospel to the people in the jungle. And then the church actually intervenes and tells them to stop because for political reasons, it was interfering with the slave trade. And the end of the movie is tragic. And yet there is this very hopeful turn right at the very end when some of the young children escape and are paddling deeper into the jungle. And you have to ask yourself, is there redemption? Where is the redemption? I got myself in a lot of trouble back in the days that I was using Titanic, you know, because, yeah, there's, um, there's adultery in the film. There's nudity. And, and frankly, I don't watch that. I, I don't expose myself to everything, gang. I close my eyes during some of the bloodier scenes of Braveheart, and, and I close my eyes to scenes of sexual exposure and nudity and sex scenes. I don't watch that. Um, but the end of Titanic, like, you've got to be kidding me. The, yes. the, the, the camera goes down into the ocean, and, and here's the ship, and here's the, the tragedy, and here's the, the shoes of the little child that died, and oh my gosh. And then through the you know power of storytelling, the ship is resurrected, and the beauty is back, and the life is back, and everyone who was a heroic person in the story is back, and they're on, and the music is playing, and you know the bride walks in dressed in white, and there's the bridegroom, so to yeah. speak. And if you're not looking for literal, like it's darn close, and you get the it's the banquet, it's the wedding feast, and. The power of redemption is a critical category in, in the way that we look at and evaluate things. I do feel like we need to now, having said all that we've said, including about the R-rated nature of the Bible, I do feel like we do now need to give a couple cautions. I went to uh, the movies last night, surprised Stace, called her up, said, hey, date night, let's just go go to dinner and go see something. And so we went out and had a bite and went to the theater. We were intending to see the current movie, 12 Strong, about the horse uh, soldiers in Afghanistan. But the trailers were so horrific. They were so evil. I literally had to plug my ears as hard as I could, close my eyes, and hum to myself so that none of that imagery and none of those sound effects were entering me, and then had to pray afterwards. In fact, little tip, gang, we actually pray before we go to every film now. We bring the work of Christ between us and the movie theater, because all the stuff that gets shown there, are you kidding me? We bring the work of Christ between us in every trailer, because although we know the movie we're going to and we're prepared for that, you don't know what you're going to be hit with in the 27 trailers they now show in advance. And so we pray against all that. 
and, and we bring the blood of Christ there to filter it. But even so, we had to leave. It was just too much. And I think that we do need to give a healthy warning in this day and age. You have to be a very discerning consumer. Yes. John, a, a great scripture that has led me and helped me navigate in terms of story and art is Philippians 4. And in Philippians 4, 8, there's this verse that says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In other words, fill your mind with stories that even though it may be a, a war movie where there is violence and there is carnage, it, it doesn't mean G or PG, precious moment stories, but what it's saying is, Find things that are pure, true, lovely, admirable, noble, and let those stories fill your mind. And so to me, that's a great navigating verse because there's so many things on TV now where I'll hear friends say, well, yeah, the story doesn't really, like it goes into some dark places, but the writing is so good. And I've I've just had to tell them, I, I really disagree with you. Like I understand a series can be well written and still be well written crap and and you don't want to fill your mind with something that goes against what's noble and good if it's going to drag you down or cause you to start doubting things or or thinking things that go opposite this verse yeah and again gang this isn't precious moments filter think of the bible Okay. Right. Think, think of all the stories. You know, David and Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah is right there in the scriptures. The difference is it's not exalted and the cost of it is very apparent. So you walk away from that going, yeah, man, that was a train wreck. You don't walk away going, wow, I'd love to maybe try that. Right. Okay. So the Bible's very, very, very graphic. Uh, the heroes of the gospel story in Jesus's life, uh, a few of them are prostitutes. So again, it's not, you know, this sweet candy world, but, but given the age we're in and given what is online, given what's available on the internet, given what's, what is coming into movie theaters, you, you do have to be a very discerning customer and you do need to pray uh, and even ask the Holy Spirit to filter the things that you're seeing. And John, to your point, you have to be willing, I think, too, to get up sometimes and turn the TV off or leave the theater or change the channel if you start to sense, uh, this isn't right. Like there has to be that upfront willingness to say, I'm done. Yeah. Like, no, the story's yeah. not worth that. And the reason, folks, is story is so powerful. The reason is because it is powerful. It does affect the human heart. So I want to end with two quick stories. I remember years ago, Stace and I went to see the long film Pearl Harbor, which one reviewer said I thought was pretty funny about the Japanese secret plot against an American love triangle. <laughs> um, but, but at the end of the movie, I was so powerfully struck by the true story of Pearl Harbor, what actually happened, and something... Um, the Spirit of God said to me while I was sitting in the theater, it's going to happen again. And two months later, there was 9-11. Like, God will speak. He will speak powerfully through story. It's still one of his favorite means. And then, most recently, Darkest Hour, the Churchill film, and watching Churchill almost alone, urging England and the world not to capitulate. And I just thought, oh my gosh, there's the church. There's the moment we're in right now. There's the courage it's going to take to resist evil and take a stand. And so God is speaking. He is speaking and he's speaking powerfully through stories. And you can learn so much about your own story. Pay attention to the emotions it takes you. Pay attention to the memories it takes you to. It may lance an old wound and and then there's an opportunity for the healing of Christ there. Be a discerning customer. Hope you've enjoyed a two-part series with John Eldridge, Alan Arnold here on stories and movies and kind of what we're looking for. 